Hi, I'm Pele Brengard. Um, I was meant to give a talk today at the conference, uh, but I unfortunately had to cancel it. Um, some important things came up that I just couldn't get uh, out of. Uh, but anyway, I'm really sorry I'm missing your conference today. Uh, so I've recorded uh, the talk for you here, and um, well, uh, I hope you enjoy it, and I hope you have a great conference. I call this talk streaming numbers in the clouds because uh, information, I think, is one of the most important parts of uh, enabling crowdfunding, scaling this up so lots of smaller companies can reach large amounts of smaller investors. Information is going to be key here and it has to be done in a streaming fashion. Uh, funding small businesses is hard. Crowdfunding is a solution, but can be risky due to information asymmetry. Crowdfunding isn't new, though. The, crowd has, the crowds have been able to fund things since the 1600s. What is new is that the crowd now will have access to funding. So let's go back in history first. I like to review history and see where we can learn from. People tend to just focus on the immediate uh, on the immediate past, but we can learn a lot from going a little bit further back. So what I, in this talk, I'm going to be calling crowdfunding 1.0, and, and these terms are just my own 1.0, 2.0, etc. So don't start spreading them uh, outside. It's just for this talk. The first companies were set up to conquer and tax. Uh, so uh, this was one of the first uh, successful um, uh, successfully funded companies, Mauna de Chio e di Fosea, sorry to any Italians out there. Uh, this was a Genoese company that was funded by uh, Genoese citizens and um, uh, royalty, etc., uh, who funded an expedition to conquer the uh, Greek island of Chio and uh, the um, port called Fokea Fot on the coast of Turkey. Um, they conquered this to essentially develop it and tax it. So uh, deal was that if you invested in this, you got a cut of the revenues. So I think this is, this is one of the first formalized uh, crowdfunding um, offerings in history. Uh, after that, most, most other companies, again, were focused on exploration and trade. Uh, so um, one of the most famous was the Dutch East India Company, the VOC. Um, I will not even attempt to pronounce that in Dutch. Uh, but this was a uh, company that was formed by joining lots of smaller trading companies into a, a giant company that controlled a large part of the world. Uh, and this company was offered on the uh, on the Dutch stock exchange, um, where lots of smaller investors own shares in it. And uh, so this this was where we started seeing crowdfunding become slightly bigger. There were more access to it. Uh, obviously, you didn't get the poorest people who were able to invest. Uh, and you definitely did not get um, your everyday uh, cooper or carpenter listing his, his uh, company for sale in the exchange, but it was open for people with money to go in, with some kind of money to, to go in and invest in these larger uh, enterprises. Uh, with that, we also started seeing bubbles and fraud. Um, one of the most famous one was the Mississippi bubble in France, uh, which was, um, this was a, a company, the Mississippi company that was promoted by a Scottish um, entrepreneur who's kind of the Bernie Madoff of his day. Um, he sold this company to go in and invest, uh, to go in and explore and conquer Mississippi and develop plantations, etc. 
Uh, this was a hugely popular company that really attracted the imagination of uh, French citizens. It was not, not just the rich that were investing here. You got all kinds of people investing. Uh, but it was a huge bubble that was based on fraud. And, all, and essentially uh, what we see here is what's one of the biggest problem investment um, as a whole is that there is uh, information asymmetry here. Uh, people trusted what John Law was saying, uh, even though he had absolutely nothing to back it up with. He knew that, that there were problems. Uh, he was a, a quite deluded man, probably very much like Bernie Madoff. Um, but people d really didn't know. Everyone, people, I mean, the bubble started, you know, with, with it being successful and people gossiping, making it even more successful in the minds of people. So everyone had to go in and invest and invest. I mean, that's how bubbles happen. But there was no real information about the state of the company. So gossip was really the main information um, point um, as part of the, of the early exchanges of the early investors. Uh, an example of this was that uh, the uh, traders were thrown out from the uh, more formal uh, London Royal Exchange because all they did was hang around and, and essentially gossip all day. So they were thrown out into the coffee shops. But here something interesting happened. Uh, the, uh, there was a, uh, a coffee shop owner called John Castang who uh, started writing down trades daily uh, and created the first data feed. I don't know if he just started noting it down in hand. I assume he did. This one here from 1698, 4th of January 1698 is interesting. It shows the price of what I assume is pounds in various cities and then price of gold, uh, pieces of eight, etc. But down in the bottom, you can see uh, it lists shares of uh, various companies. And these were companies that lots of people had shares in. So the bank stock was the, uh, uh, the Bank of England. Then you got the India Company, the African Company, the Hudson Bay Company, uh, which uh, uh, colonized uh, large parts of Canada, um, et cetera. So there, there weren't really a lot of companies here, but we see the start of of a uh, of a trade feed going on here, so um, he called this the course of the exchange and other things, uh, which is quite fascinating to me. Uh, this his coffee house, Jonathan's coffee house, became such a popular place for traders to hang out and actually physically trade and record the trade prices with with John. So. Uh, this later became the London Stock Exchange. Um, it's very interesting that these large institutions they actually started from a very much a bottom-down approach. So the London Exchange, London Stock Exchange, one where the Royal Exchange, which was a, a top-down approach, failed. Uh, similarly, uh, in the insurance market, Lloyd's Coffee House was where everyone gossiped and. Uh, about ships and uh, bought and sold insurance for said ships um, and uh, this became Lloyds of London. So just to repeat, information sources for what I call crowdfunding 1.0 is um, the primitive data feeds at, such as the course of the exchange and other things by John Castang and gossip and probably gossip was the largest data source at that point. Now we enter into the crowdfunding 2.0 era uh, where things are starting to scale up. This is the industrial revolution. We start seeing all kinds of smaller projects where before you had a few very large projects such as, such as let's go conquer and trade India, let's go conquer and trade Africa. Now we have smaller projects such as local train lines, mills, mines, factories, etc., etc. And and 
they weren't just smaller projects, there was lots of projects all of a sudden. So lots of companies being founded uh, to, to do various kinds of things. Uh, there were, um, I mean, every, every city had all of a sudden had lots of, of, of companies going on. Uh, but for a, a small investor, good information became harder to obtain. Uh, I haven't researched specific cases here, but I, I know that there were lots of fraudulent offerings during this time. And this uh, basically made the government to start uh, looking into this, looking into regulating companies and investing. So the first step was uh, creating um, national companies laws. Uh, I don't know when uh, this started in Switzerland, uh, but in in England in the late 1800s, the first company's law was was passed, and um, this brought a lot. Of, all, I mean, the whole point of this legis legislation was to protect investors. So, uh, one of the key features here was a central registry of all companies. So, to start a company, you had to go and enlist it here. There were various reporting requirements, so you had to um, report who your directors were, uh, the amount of shares, um, major investors, etc. And it also brought in the requirements for annual reports and auditing. Um, during this same period, you also started seeing uh, much better information sources uh, from from private players, so you started getting the first live data feeds. Uh, this is an example of a, of a ticker tape, um, which was sent uh, via telegraphs um, since 1863. So this was the predecessor of, of today's um, Dow Jones feeds and, and Bloomberg feeds, etc. cetera. Uh, and it's quite amazing when you think about it that since the late 1800s, uh, these feeds were going out into all kinds of offices um, throughout uh, various countries. Um, I've seen, even seen um, uh, pictures of cruise ships with ticker tape rooms where I guess they must get them uh, via shortwave radio or something like that. Um, quite amazing this, this happened. Um, so to sum up, the information sources for crowdfunding 2.0 period were newspapers that didn't cover that, but that should be pretty obvious. Uh, the ticker feeds, uh, government records, annual reports, and auditors. Of course, there's still a lot of gossip. Now, the crowdfunding 3.0 period is essentially the modern period, and, I, and I'm going to say that this starts after the 1929 uh, uh, panic. Um, with this, a lot of countries started bringing in securities regulation that started uh, really protecting small investors. Um, particularly, there were much stricter laws in public offerings, and these laws started also restricted private offerings. So, there are now all of a sudden limits on who could invest in private offerings. This was done in the, in the US anyway, to protect grandmothers from investing into fraudulent companies. Um, quarterly reporting for public companies uh, and uh, became a lot easier to invest in public companies because all of a sudden there was a lot more information available. And um, this, uh, yeah, everyone can now go in and, and find out all kinds of information about public companies. Yet, all of these things that made it better to invest in public companies really also made it a lot harder for small companies to be funded. And part of this is, I mean, besides the fact that, um, that ordinary, that smaller investors can't go in and, and invest in most countries in in um, smaller companies and private offerings. It's, it's a very costly thing to go in and, and invest because there really is a complete lack of information. Again, it's the information 
asymmetry here. That's the problem. Um, so VCs and angel investors, they tend to do a lot of due diligence before investing. And this is, this is very expensive. They, they will have teams of people going in, analyzing everything, checking and double checking all the legal records, checking source code to make sure that there's not GPL license code, etc. They talk to customers. Um, so it's, it's a very, very long and, and tedious and costly process. Also, managing existing investments is, is time consuming. Often investors will want to be on the board of a company so they have a, a, a good idea of what's going on and um, essentially to keep informed on a, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and outside board meetings, there tends to be a lot of communication back and forth between investors and uh, founders. And a lot of founders also request help from investors. Uh, uh, often that's one of the reasons that people look for investments is to get investors who are well connected. Uh, but all of this means that it's often not economical for VC to invest less than 500K. Um, and I would probably say that most VCs would prefer to invest considerably more than this, at least in, uh, in the US. Now, accelerators is a new approach that, that hack this, this whole concept. Um, and uh, it's all about lowering risk and lowering the cost. Um, so. One of the main parts of lowering risk is that they only invest a small amount. Uh, this could be, say, $20,000. Um, they, and in exchange, they only take a small amount of equity, and that's done more than anything to protect the uh, the uh, funded company, the uh, the entrepreneurs. Um, to be able to manage this, uh, they often have a very short uh, batched application and interview process. So uh, most of these programs, they will have two uh, application deadlines a year and uh, everyone fills out a fairly short form instead of a business plan and they send that in. Um, then. Um, a selection uh, committee within the accelerator, they pick through the best of them and bring them in for, for a short interview. This is often just a 10 minute interview. Uh, and during that very short period, a decision is made on, on whether to invest or not. Um, the batching of it also helps uh, the ongoing management on their investment because you get all of these companies working together, and this creates a community. Um, and so thus the investors can, can rely on, on, on using relatively short time for each company, but promote a culture that helps these companies help each other out. Uh, so this, is, this has been a successful model, but it does require uh, some very specific uh, very specific ki kinds of people um, leading the process. So the, the two most successful groups are Y Combinator and um, Techstars. There are others and um, a lot of them aren't quite as successful as Y Combinators and Techstars and a lot of it's because it's, it's a really, it's a very specific job and I'm not sure it can scale much more than it already has has done um, so that's that can be a bit of a problem so an overview over common information sources here in, in, the, in the modern era of crowdfunding Frio is live trade feeds live news feeds um, the internet yeah your most most regular small investors they get their information from Yahoo Finance or Google Finance, uh, et cetera, et cetera, or from their broker. Um, you can also go in and, and find all the quarterly filings for public companies. This, is, this can be very useful reading. 
and um, the the problem, as I mentioned before, is that for investing in private companies, even the investors that are allowed to invest, it's quite a costly process uh, to to perform due diligence to actually get the information that they require before investing. So what everyone's calling crowdfunding now, I'm dubbing crowdfunding 4.0. So this is this new modern era. And um, one of the big differences with uh, crowdfunding 4.0 is that this again allows the uh, crowd to invest in small, often crazy projects. Uh, one of the most famous um, marketplaces here is uh, Kickstarter. Kickstarter is a uh, project funding um, website. It's not equity based. So uh, this, uh, this is one way they've been able to operate uh, before any of the new rules have come in. So what you do is you go in and you have a project which could be creating a, a new sous vide food circulator gadget or it could be some kind of book or a movie or a, a, an album recording. And then you ask for people to, to essentially donate for, for this. And the key here is with uh, Kickstarter is that there is a minimum dollar amount that you decide that you need for, for the project to be successful. And uh, if you can get enough people to donate, then the project seems successful and you get the money and whatever comes after that as well. Um, backers, as they're called, uh, they often receive various things like t-shirts or early access to projects um, as a thanks for, for backing these projects. As you can see here in the latest Kickstarter stats, they have a 44% success rate, which is, I'd, I'd say it's pretty good. Um, it's doesn't, it means that it's not automatic, you know, just putting a project on Kickstarter doesn't mean you're going to be successful. You have to work at it through social media, etc. Information in these projects, again, because it's more about donating, there are no ret real returns expected except for t-shirts, etc. Um, information is handled quite well through a blog-like interface and most of the, uh, of the projects, they use social media very well to promote their project and keep people informed about what's going on. Now in the US, and I'm sorry I'm talking about the US here, I don't know what's been going on in either the EU or Switzerland with regarding to, to um, crowdfunding legislation. But in the US, uh, President Obama um, signed into law the uh, Jobs Act um, a, a couple of months ago. And this Jobs Act, amongst other things, opens up uh, the market for equity crowdfunding. What it really does is that it um, simplifies and it, uh, a lot of the rules that were put in place after, after the 1929 panic. So we're now waiting to see what the specific rules are because the SEC, which is the Securities Exchange Commission in the US, are now working on the specific rules for how this can happen. And what you're already seeing is you're seeing lots of these crowdfunding exchanges or marketplaces popping up, uh, just waiting for for uh, for the law to to uh, be in effect. Um, here's one early shares. Uh, it's just a local Miami-based one, um, but they were one of the main lobbyists trying to get crowdfunding. Uh, trying to make it possible in the US to, to do equity-based crowdfunding. This is their video. Are you looking for some seed capital for your great idea? Early shares can help. Do you have a few hundred dollars to invest in an exciting new startup company? 
With Early Shares, you can. Early Shares is a revolutionary new way to raise money for your business by allowing hundreds or even thousands of individuals to invest a small amount of money into new businesses, fueling new ideas. Early Shares is a platform that gives entrepreneurs the ability to spread the word about their concept or idea through social media and the internet, while investors can search and find pre-screened companies and ideas they would like to invest in. As interest grows among investors, the idea gets followers and investments, helping entrepreneurs reach their funding goal. Once the funding goal is reached, the entrepreneur can launch their business, and shares of the business are issued to the crowd of investors. Some entrepreneurs may also reward investors with samples, perks, or even pre-sell a product as part of their funding pitch. These are called investor rewards. EarlyShares.com, a new way to invest. Register now to raise money or invest in new business. www.earlyshares.com Angel list, while strictly speaking, some people wouldn't call it a crowdfunding uh, company. It's pretty close to it. What it does is that it allows... Um, it's essentially a marketplace that's very democratic. Anyone can go in and list their company and it uses a social network like interface to, to show connections, etc., and tell people about investments that are, have been made. So this is a place that allows people with a good idea to go in and reach angel investors. Uh, the actual investment, the paperwork, all of that stuff doesn't happen within here, but people go in and um, as a kind of social proof to, to mark that, okay, um, uh, Gabriel Weinberg, he invested in this and this company, or Matt Mullenweg invested in this company. Um, so it's quite a good uh, project, uh, good site that, and community that's really helped a lot of startups out. Funders Club um, is also quite interesting. They've received a lot of press just recently. Um, it seems fairly simple in the way it works. Uh, right now, I think they are open for business to uh, what's known as accredited investors in the US. So basically, the types of people who are allowed to be angel investors, they can go in and um, in, invest here. Uh, currently, the companies that are listed are uh, Y Combinator backed companies. And um, so companies that have gone through the accelerator process. And this solves some of the due diligence issue because if a company has gone through the Y Combinator process, you can expect that uh, while there's a f fairly small amount of due diligence done up front, you could expect that the company is, um, is fairly well run and has some kind of traction. At least that's what people would expect. Uh, I'd be interested to see what's going to happen with them in the future, um, whether anyone will be able to come in list or whether they're going to limit it to companies from various accelerators. Boost Funder, the startup marketplace, is another new one. Um, they are, from the look of it, they look very similar to Angel List, except uh, they are going to be handling the actual mechanics of the investment as well. Uh, I'm going to keep my eye on them anyway. So there are plenty of these marketplaces and, and communities out there. But uh, most of them still have some problems with uh, lack of information. So there's still some uh, information asymmetry going on here. You as an investor coming in, you don't quite know what's going on. Um, you, you can't see the financials. You don't know whether people are telling the truth. So um, the current information sources that are available for crowdfunding 4.0 um, type uh, projects are Twitter. You can follow the investors on Twitter and see what people talk. Uh, you can follow the projects on Twitter, see what they're doing. Um, 
the marketplace websites themselves, tech news, blogs. Um, all of these may be real time, but um, they're also all quite subjective. Um, so this is people's opinion. So if the company tweets out, we're launching this new product, that's a company tweeting out, we're launching this new project. We don't know specific details about it. We don't know the numbers about it. We can't verify all of these things. So parsing large amounts of the subjective data is, is a bit hard to do. Um, so marketplaces, they will need to perform some kind of due diligence as well. Uh, and the question is whether they should do very heavy due diligence like the VCs, uh, have very short application interview processes similar to the accelerators, batch things up like accelerators or, or just be open to, to anyone. There are a lot of these questions out here and I think these are the kinds of things that are gonna differentiate the marketplaces. Now, this is Hernando de Soto who is a uh, famous Peruvian economist. He wrote The Mystery of Capital. It's a, a fantastic book about how, um, about why the developing world even when modern institutions have been forced onto them, still haven't developed to the level as they should have. Um, so he says, um, imagine a country where nobody can identify who owns what, addresses cannot easily be verified, people cannot be made to pay their debts, resources cannot conveniently be turned into money, ownership cannot be divided into shares, description of assets are not standardized, and cannot be easily compared. And the rules that govern property vary from neighborhood to neighborhood or even from street to street. And what he's talking about here is, this is the life in the extra legal world. This is the life in the, in the, um, in the favelas, in the um, shanty towns throughout the world. There are lots of business and property in these places, but there's no good standardized way of of really measuring them, comparing them, et cetera, et cetera, except just word of mouth. And I think this is, this is actually very similar to uh, what's going on with, uh, with these investments, with, with cloud-funded investments, because you have lots of small projects and you really don't have any good standardized way of valuing them. Um, so, first of all, you can't verify the ownership of a startup in an easy way. Uh, there's no way of verifying revenue and other claims by the startup. There's no way of comparing multiple startups um, so you can start ranking them. Um, if there are problems, it is quite difficult to use the legal system, um, mainly because it's too expensive for the size of your investment. So it, it's for small investors to actually go in and, and, and get their money back or, or denounce them if there, are, if there are any problems. Also different crowdfunding sites will have different rules and I'm not sure how much of a problem this is gonna be, uh, we'll, we'll see, but it, it could become a problem in the future. Um, so, I, a lot of what I see is uh, people are trying to copper, copy how things are done in, in public or venture-funded companies. I don't think it'll work because this, that's really a top-down approach. And uh, the, most of the p legislation for in, the, in the public for public companies comes out of years and years of history and tradition and regulation and bubbles and panics and this and that. And it's a huge burden for a very small company to have to do all of this. Even venture funded companies, they have all kinds of systems in place um, that don't really scale very well. So for example, um, I mean, there's uh, a, a great example is venture funded companies, many of them, they use accountants that are recommended to them by their VCs. And these VCs, I mean, these accountants have all kinds of process in place to go in and create the financials that the VCs want to see. 
and they have built these systems up over the years, but they are quite old-fashioned by most standards. So, for example, uh, I know this personally that I've worked with lots of very innovative companies in in the Bay Area and California, and all of them, pretty much with, without exception, uh, will only pay you with a check, with a mailed check. And the reason they do this is so is because the accountant companies have told them that's the only way that they should pay. They normally don't give any particular reason, it's just that that's what you need to do. Also, uh, contracts are still faxed and signed um, the old-fashioned way because that's what the law firms that the VCs use for... Uh, they, they, they want all of this done. That eases the due diligence process for them because that's the way it's always been done. So they have these systems in place for managing old-fashioned kinds of accountants, old-fashioned kinds of contracts. Uh, and that's just not going to scale up uh, with the amount of companies, um, I should say scale down to smaller companies and large amounts of them. Um, so what we need to do is look at bottom-up reforms that are derived from understanding and recognition of existing extra-legal systems and customs. Again, this was from Hernando de Soto. Um, and we, we really need to do this for crowdfunded companies as well. And what, what do I mean by um, doing the bottom-up approach? Most of the companies that are being, that are being talked at being crowdfunded are are some kind of web-based company nowadays. Um, this may not be true for everyone, but what we are generally good at is generating data, generating and parsing data real time. We do things online. We should not, as an online company, generate a printed or a PDF uh, annual report or a quarterly report. It should be online. The data in it should be verifiable and I see absolutely no reason why this information shouldn't be available. The raw data should be available in a, in a streaming way so people can go in and see live updated data of the status of the company. All of this is technically possible. We already have most of this data. We just need to learn to put it together in, in a, the right way. We do this for our own services all the time. Um, and our programmers know how to do this again. So I, I don't think there's much excuses that we shouldn't be doing this. Uh, we should also, so, so yes, sorry, I mumbled here, but, but we need to do this for all our legal and financial structures as well. So for example, for legal due diligence, all incorporation documents should be online and they should be verifiable with links to uh, the government website, for example. Most governments, they have some kind of uh, way of verifying uh, a company. It should be an online share register. Again, one of, one of these old nasty habits that the Silicon Valley accountants have or and law firms is that they have a... Most, most companies, their share register is just an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, it's normally... At the accountants or the law firm, um, and um, that's the reality of it. This should be online. I mean, we nowadays we do know about such things as as databases and websites and stuff. We can do this. It's not really all that hard to do. We just need to do to create these sites. And I know of various people who are are working on such things. How many shares are owned by insiders? This is the kind of information that public companies report um, annually and quarterly. Uh, there's no reason why we couldn't have this online updatable. It should show how many uh, shares that, for example, in my company, uh, Economico, should show how many shares I have. It should show how many shares my co-founders have. And it should show a aggregate of external investors 
uh, how many they have. Uh, for privacy reasons, we may not want to show the individual $100 investor. Um, this should all be real time. So if there is a sale of shares, a transfer of shares of any sort, this could um, create an activity record in some kind of uh, monitoring site, like a, like a uh, Facebook kind of uh, environment. Um, there's also due diligence services coming up now. Uh, these are, uh, this is one I just discovered the other day called CrowdCheck. Uh, this is run by a bunch of former SEC lawyers and um, what they will do is they will go in and do various levels of due diligence on, on uh, companies just to make sure that they are who they say they are and that they are owners of, of their companies, that the company records are in order, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so this, this is definitely going to be an important part of it because I expect that any kind of government uh, regulation of these things will require all of these things to have been done. So it's, it's good that you can outsource this. Outsource this. Uh, what about financial data? We should have live sales data. We shouldn't have uh, links with banks. We don't necessarily need to go down into complete detail about you know um, how much coffee the company buys a year or anything like that. But it would be a good idea to have all of this information online. Um, this allows you to show live profit and loss and live balance sheet. Um, linking this up with the information from the, um, from the stock register, the share register, you can start, uh, you can show people how much their shares are worth, uh, fundamentally speaking, and you can also calculate PE ratios and all of these kinds of things. And, and these things are very useful for evaluating companies. Sales analytics is something most companies have. So uh, lists of subs how many subscriptions do you have to your service if you're a, sus you a subscription-based service? Um, what are your in-app purchasing sales? What kind of products are being sold? At what, what volumes? Um, most companies have an, already have calculation for estimated lifetime value of customers. All of this information can be very useful for, for valuing uh, a company and yeah we already have this information we just need to aggregate it in economic I have to say my company what we're trying to do is we're trying to help trying to make it easy to aggregate a lot of this information uh, including the financial stuff um, to, to have it in a nice easy way for investors to see uh, advertising analytics is another Another thing, what's your click-through rate on your ads? Uh, what's the cost per click? Uh, tie this in with the sales analytics and some uh, investors might go in and be able to create some interesting valuations based on this. So they could go in and calculate, okay, if we make this investment and they use this money for advertising, how much do we think the company will grow doing this? Um, there's all the traditional usage analytics sites as well, like Google Analytics, Mixpanel, etc. Um, many companies already provide access to this information to their investors or prospective investors. Uh, so I see no reason why this shouldn't be done in a, for crowdfunding uh, companies as well. Again, it doesn't have to be the most detailed, but it should be live. It should, it should be real-time aggregate information that would be useful. Um, the other thing that I think is, is very much key here is to allow p different people to value a company uh, based on this streaming data. This allows individual investors and marketplaces to go in and compare um, different companies listed. So um, yeah, a marketplace, they might have a formula for different kinds of companies uh, and rank these companies using this. And, and when I say formula, it could be, you know, we look at the balance sheet, we look at the, at the, at the revenue, we compare that with the, 
with ver the various kinds of sales, we can see we can calculate what's the value of all the current subscriptions that we have over over the their life lifetime, etc. Estimated lifetime. Um, there are all of these different things that people can go in and calculate and uh, to to rank these companies. So the marketplace has said they could have their valuation. Businesses themselves, they could have their own internal valuations that they use um, to um, help motivate themselves and employees. They might want to share these internal valuations. Investors can calculate their own. And there's also space for third-party analysts to calculate and sell valuation formulas. Some of these uh, could potentially turn into a, a replacement in the future for mutual funds. So rather than buying part of a fund, you could buy a, a, a third-party analyst's um, investment strategy. I believe there are already sites that do this for, for futures and options trading. Um, besides the information, uh, we, there are various other ways that we can make it more attractive to invest. Um, do you guys remember dividends? This is this thing that companies used to have, and I, companies still have it, large companies in particular. But most startups, uh, for most startups, dividends is a foreign word. And there are very good reasons for this because um, VCs tend to, um, tend to want growth. They want you to reinvest your profit in growth because their goal is to grow all their companies and have an exit. And that's fine. That's part of their business model and that's what they should focus on. But a lot of small companies really should focus on revenue. There are many, many companies um, that sell small services, small products, and they don't really need to go on to, um, they don't need to be a NASDAQ. They don't need a, a uh, $3 billion exit because they might be making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year or a million dollars a year or something like that. And um, I think most companies, that this is like probably the safest thing to do. Uh, 37 Signals is of course one of the most famous of these cases and they, while they have taken some investment just to get some cash out, um, this is this is just, they're all about generating uh, cash flow. And um, I think most crowdfunded companies should do the same thing. Uh, as I mentioned before, dividends don't fit the VC's grow, grow, grow strategy. Um, and I think dividends may work very well for crowdfunding. Um, nice thing about it is that you can go in and verify the dividends with the live financials. So you can, you can look at it and you can see the uh, profits coming in and depending on how often the dividends are, are paid out. In most cases nowadays it's once a year, but you can have a good idea whether uh, you're going to be making dividends this year. This helps you buy the share. And dividends should be paid out automatically through whatever uh, crowdfunding site or whatever the uh, the uh, stock uh, the share register share management site uh, the company uses. Here's another approach uh, which I think is even better. Um, Lighter Capital is a uh, fairly new uh, investment company, and what they do is they give you a revenue loan, as they call it. And um, a revenue loan is basically they give you cash and over a period of time you pay them a certain percentage of your revenue. And this is your pre-tax revenue. Uh, so, um, and and it's, yeah, your actual revenue, so before any other expenses go out. So this is essentially, this would be an expense for you as a company. I'm not a tax lawyer, so I may be completely wrong here. But um, so this is an example of their calculator. 
So let's say that you will have $20,000 worth of revenue in July, 19000 in June, 18000 in May. Um, they will give you $100,000 for this 26.2% reven revenue rate. And it's important to realize it's 20%, 26.2, it's not 26.2 of the 100,000, it's 26.2 of whatever revenue you have. Um, so it's, it's fairly low risk for, for you as the company. So I think, I, I think these are very interesting uh, kinds of loans. Um, you know, they're not equity. Uh, it's a combined loan and revenue share agreement. It's much simpler to and more transparent than <clears throat> equity and dividends. And I think various companies should definitely start looking at this for crowdfunding. The other really interesting uh, option here is pre-selling credits to your customers. Uh, we at Economico, we are looking at enabling this as, as part of our services for uh, crowdfunded companies, uh, but there are various other companies doing so as well. It, this reduces regulatory issues. You can sell to existing customer base. Uh, if you have the other um, due diligence um, measures in place, like the live information, you should be able to build up enough trust as well to sell to new customers. So what does pre-selling credits mean? It means, let's say you have a, um, let's say you have a, uh, a new site that you're launching and um, a new subscription-based site. So you might sell uh, $1,000 of credits to potential customers. They're people who want to see your service. They need your service. And this $1,000 that they, that they buy credits from you for is, stu is credits that they can use to pay their subscriptions, for example. That, that would be an example for web-based businesses. Clearbond is a, um, a great new example out of um, San Francisco where they are working it with local food businesses in local communities uh, who may need to expand or start up and um, local customers can go in and prepay credit to for example buy pastry. Here's the video, um, it's quite interesting. We're Clearbun and we're introducing an easier way for small businesses to get funded from a source they already know, their loyal customers. Let's say I have a bakery that makes the most delicious pastries with organic fruit. As I'm getting more popular, I need to buy an additional oven. Sure, I could go to a bank, but I'm looking for more than just money. I'm interested in crowdfunding. Now, let's say I'm a customer of the bakery, and I want to see it thrive. Sure, I'll go there every week, but I'm willing to do more. I'm willing to give my money in advance, especially if I know I'll get rewarded for it. And I'm not talking about a signed t-shirt. What I'm interested in is getting more of the products I love, but I still want to get them when I want. Because let's face it, it won't make a lot of sense for me to get a big load of pastries all at once. That's where Clearbun comes in. If you're a loyal fan of a business, you pay them in advance and in return, the business gives you store credit. Kind of like a loan that gets repaid with goods and services. Here's how it works. The business that wants funding posts its prepayment offers online, typically with an extra bonus for larger amounts. For instance, for a $500 prepayment, the business could offer 550 credits for future spending. As a customer, I can choose the level I want to prepay. Then, in my account online, I can see my balance and watch how I eat my credits over time. When I go to the store or market, the business uses its laptop or mobile phone to charge my purchases to my store credit balance. Essentially, I'm paying with my name, since I already prepaid with my money before. The best part? Customers get the flexibility to use their credits at other participating businesses as well. Clearbun's first market is an underfunded market that we all care about, local food businesses. 
before you buy it, food needs time and money to grow and ripen. Paying it in advance is a great way to fund it. The service is offered through our partner, Slow Money. Slow Money is an amazing nationwide network of food entrepreneurs and investors. The crowdfunding service is called Credibles, as in edible credits, and has received enthusiastic feedback so far. The time is ripe for a more direct model for customers to invest in the businesses of their community. Essentially, if you eat, you can be an investor. Our goal is to make such community funding possible and more easily accessible. If you'd like to get involved, we'd love to hear from you. So they help the local food businesses expand. Uh, it's, this is a model, the Clearbond model is, is great and I hope they expand uh, all over the US and maybe internationally. Um, as I mentioned before, the model can be expanded into web-based businesses as well. Um, so as a conclusion, it's very important when we talk about crowdfunding that to realize that regulatory issues is not the only problem. That's where almost all the discussion has been, at least here in the U.S. It's on, let's, let's make it, let's let us sell equity in our, in our companies, etc. But by doing this, you know, we really need to create a new ecosystem. Just like previous generations started creating their own ecosystems, just like John Kestang uh, started writing his list, and which later became more and more formalized and became the London Stock Exchange, we need to do the same kind of things. Information is absolutely key here. We need to remove as much information asymmetry as possible. Uh, companies need to open up and uh, share the data, and this has to be done in a very easy, simple way. So that was my talk. Thank you very much. And again, I'm really sorry that I couldn't be there today. Uh, please feel free to contact me. Uh, this is my contact information. Um, thank you very much. And I hope you have a great conference in Switzerland.